from the American Experience Storybook, Stonewall Jackson, 1824 to 1863. To move swiftly, strike vigorously, and secure all the fruits of victory is the secret of successful war. Quoted by George Francis Robert Henderson in Stonewall Jackson and the American Civil War, 1904. For most of his life, Stonewall Jackson was Thomas Jonathan Jackson, a quirky but hardworking man from Virginia. After losing most of his family to illness and growing up with his uncles, Thomas was accepted to West Point Military Academy, where his social and academic struggles fueled his determination to succeed. Thomas graduated the academy just as the Mexican-American War began. He fought bravely along with Robert E. Lee and left the war considered a hero. Between this war and the Civil War, he taught physics and artillery at the Virginia Military Institute. Jackson's students thought him strange. His hypochondria convinced him that one of his arms was shorter than the other, so to hide it, he kept one arm raised as he lectured. Thomas wanted Virginia to stay in the Union, but when he had to choose, he stood with his homeland over the federal government. He earned his nickname Stonewall at the First Battle of Bull Run or Manassas. The Confederate Army had a hole in its defenses and Thomas charged in with his troops to cover it. The opposing Union general remarked that he stood like a stone wall. Stonewall Jackson was promoted to a major general after that battle. His Shenandoah Valley campaign was so successful that he was asked to join forces with Robert E. Lee. In Chancellorsville, the two performed a famous maneuver of splitting up their small army and attacking Union soldiers from multiple sides. Sadly, just after this great victory, Stonewall was hit by friendly fire and died in the hospital of pneumonia. The following excerpt is from Personal Recollections of Stonewall Jackson by John G. Giddings. In a letter to his cousin, Stonewall once wrote, I am most anxious to see our family enjoying that high standard and influence that it possessed in the days of yore. He said his Jackson relations were very clannish and he was warm to his family attachments himself, but he would give none of them military office unless they first prove themselves worthy of it by actual service on the battlefield. From this section, he appointed his relative, Colonel Alfred H. Jackson, on his staff. This gallant officer fell on the battlefield of Cedar Mountain and died soon thereafter. He was buried in the cemetery at Lexington near Stonewall's grave. Stonewall's mother was Julia Neal, the daughter of Thomas Neal of Parkersburg. Her father was descended on the maternal side from the Lewises, a distinguished family, the relatives of Washington, and prominent in the Indian Wars and Revolutionary History. Stonewall Jackson felt all the pride of the descent from a long line of worthy ancestors. He also felt his lack of education and how much it would cripple him in his efforts to rise from the humbled position in which he had been cast by cruel fate. Hence, while he was riding over the hills of Lewis County in the performance of his duties as deputy sheriff, when the news was brought to him that there was a vacancy at West Point from his congressional district, he immediately set about to obtain the appointment. His friends, knowing his manly, brave spirit, knowing also that it was of such metal that soldiers were made, were especially anxious that he should obtain the appointment. Tom now began to study his books at night after his hard labor of the day. He was doubtful about his ability to enter West Point, but he was determined that he would fail through no lack of effort on his part, either to obtain the appointment or to sustain himself after he had done so. But his impetuous temper could not brook delay, so it came about that he started alone and with poor outfit on the long journey to Washington City before he had received any notice that he could get the appointment. The writer lives in the town where Jackson was born and was often conversed with old citizens who were men grown at that time. They had told him that Jackson made the journey on the foot to Washington, 
a distance of nearly 300 miles, carrying his clothes in his saddlebags, in order to solicit the appointment to West Point from Mr. Hayes, the representative from his district. It is said Mr. Hayes was much startled at the apparition of a country boy dressed in homespun and all travel-stained, marching into his presence with the saddle pockets on his shoulder and abruptly demanding the appointment as cadet to West Point. The congressman thought, considering his limited opportunities, surely Jackson was not qualified to pass the examination which was required to enter that institution. But when he had learned that he had made the long journey on foot over two mountain ranges and through the forest for 300 miles, merely to ask for the appointment, and that he must have it. He then replied, you shall have it. It is related that Mr. Hayes had consented to give him the appointment. He asked Jackson if he would not like to walk over to the city and see the sights, but he declined, saying, I would like to climb up in the dome of the Capitol and take a view from there, and then he would be ready to go on to West Point and begin his work, and he was anxious to do so as soon as possible. His life at West Point was a long struggle. He was barely able to sustain himself in his class for a year or two, but he gradually forged ahead, and it was thought that if the course of study had been several years longer, he would have climbed to the top. The cadets at first were disposed to treat him with special rigor, as he appeared unsophisticated, but in time they came to respect him and to believe that his sincerity of purpose and unwearied application, he would be able to acquit himself with credit, which he did. Let us return now to the scenes at Virginia Military Institute and to my intercourse with Jackson as a professor before I knew him in the sterner duties of war. It was not until my second year at the Military Academy that I came to recite in the classes taught by Major Jackson. But in the meanwhile, I was under his instruction at artillery practice, which consisted principally, as far as the plebes were concerned, in drawing the pieces and caissons. The piece is a large artillery gun, like a small cannon, and the caisson is a two-wheeled cart that carries the artillery ammunition. Jackson always wore his uniform and his military cap, the visor of which almost touched his nose. He was lank and long-limbed and walked with a long, measured stride, swaying his arms leisurely, while his gray-blue eyes seemed to search the ground in front. He was expressive and bore without doubt the impress of genius. Calm dignity, unaffected modesty, sincerity, and the intense honesty of his nature were imprinted on his countenance and shone forth in every trait of his manners. I will admit that the cadets generally did not regard him in this light, but differently. Yet such was my opinion at the time. And in looking back through the vista of years, I believe it to be a correct one. At artillery practice, we soon learned that Major Jackson was a very strict and exacting officer. He expected every cannoneer to do his duty, and every plebe, who served in place of a horse, too. One day, on the parade ground, A fellow plebe managed in some way to draw out a linchpin from the wheel of a limber at which I was pulling, and as a consequence, in trotting downhill at a fast pace, the wheel flew off with considerable force. As the fates would have it, it rolled directly toward old Jack, who was looking in an opposite direction. He turned his head in time to see it approaching, and although it passed within a few inches of his person, he did not bulge from his tracks. A cadet remarked, He would not have moved if it had been a cannonball going right through him. But we soon observed that his gaze was fixed intently on our battery in a way that made us feel very uncomfortable. And in a brief space, we were placed under arrest, officers, cannoneers, horses, all. And as a result, this breach of discipline was settled in a way that would not invite any repetition of the offense. Professor Jackson was an able instructor at artillery tactics. But in the regular college course, he did not appear to have any special genius for teaching. Yet he was always a conscientious, laborious instructor. He was said to be dyspeptic and perhaps was something of a hypochondriac, as his health had been very much impaired by his service in Mexico. He had been at a water cure establishment in the north, and the prescription had been given to him to live on stale bread and buttermilk. 
He followed this prescription for some time while boarding in a hotel in Lexington, and these peculiarities attracted the attention of the public, and he was much laughed at by the rude and coarse. He bore their jests with patience. In a like manner, he carried out another order from the water cure, to go to bed at nine o'clock. If that hour found him at a party, a lecture, or a religious exercise, he would invariably take his leave. His dyspepsia caused drowsiness, and he often went to sleep while sitting in his chair. He was a devout member of the Presbyterian Church over which the Reverend Dr. White presided, but he would sleep during the service, and it is stated that Jackson was thrown into confusion on a public occasion when a mesmerist failed to put him to sleep. Someone in the audience called out, No one can put Major Jackson to sleep but Reverend Dr. White. It was the custom at the military school to fire salutes of artillery on the 4th of July and Washington's birthday. In honor of such occasions, Major Jackson would always don his best uniform and wear his finest sword, a very handsome one, which the cadet said had been presented to him by the ladies of New Orleans at the close of the Mexican War. In the gray dawn of the morning, he would come marching on the parade ground with his fine saber tucked well under his left arm. He had the long stride, as had been noticed, like that of a dismounted cavalryman, and on such occasion his manners would be brisk, if not cheery, for he looked special pride in those celebrations and was very punctilious in all their observations. Major Jackson married a daughter of Dr. Junkin, president of Washington College in the second year of my stay at Lexington. He then took up his residence in town. Before his removal from the barracks, however, an incident occurred which will go to show the estimate in which he was held even by the most intractable characters. A number of cadets who were about to be dismissed through incompetency in their studies or for excess of demerit marks while on a Christian frolic made a raid on the professor's rooms in the barracks and despoiled them. Major Jackson's room alone was left intact. It is difficult to determine why these young vandals should have respected his quarters when they seemed to respect nothing else. Some suggested that, as cadets, they respected his military fame won in Mexico. It is a notable fact that even at that time the cadets had an abiding faith in Jackson as a military man, and perhaps very few of them were ever afterwards much surprised at his great achievements in war. But I have learned that after my time at the Institute, Jackson became unpopular as a professor through his rigid notions of discipline and his uncompromising enforcement of the rules. He was intolerant of neglect of duty, inattention to studies, and carelessness of drill, and thereby became uncongenial and, through his eccentricities, became an object of the tricks and witticisms of idle cadets. He was one of the most scrupulously truthful men ever lived, and even carried his exactitude of expression and performance to extremes in small matters. On one occasion, he borrowed the key of the library of the Literary Society and promised the secretary to return it within an hour. However, becoming absorbed in his book, he put the key in his pocket and did not think of it again until he had reached a boarding place in town, nearly a mile away. Then, although a hard storm had sprung up in the meantime, he turned about and marched all the way back through the rain to deliver the key as he had promised, though he knew the library would not be used and the key would not be needed on that day. In conversation, if he ever happened to make an ironical remark, even if it were so plainly ironical that none could misapprehend it, yet would he invariably qualify his expression by saying, not meaning exactly what I say. This peculiarity of speech became almost a byword with the cadets and subjected him to much embarrassment, but such was his regard for truth that he would not depart from it, even in jest, without immediately correcting his statement. He belonged to a literary society in Lexington, which embraced in its membership men of learning and ability. It was a custom of the society to hold a series of public lectures during the winter season. This was one of the few entertainments the cadets were permitted to attend, and when Major Jackson's turn came to lecture, there was considerable interest invinced by them in anticipating the subject of his lectures and the manner in which he would acquit himself. When he appeared on the lecture platform, he was embarrassed, it is true, 
and his lecture lacked an oratorical effect, yet it was said at the time to have been one of the best of the whole course and was very entertaining. The subject of his discourse was acoustics, and he discussed very effectively all that was then known about the properties of sound. He said that it was an undeveloped science and that no doubt in the near future progress would be made in it and discoveries especially in the transmission of sound. This prediction has since been verified in the perfecting of the telephone. It must be admitted that Major Jackson was regarded by the cadets and others as an eccentric man. Either from his impaired health by his service in Mexico or from some other cause, it seemed a fact that he always seemed to be more or less sensitive and ill at ease in his intercourse with strangers. Speaking from a social standpoint, no man ever had a more delicate regard for the feelings of others than he, and nothing would embarrass him more than any contretemps that might occur in his presence to cause pain or distress of mind to others. Hence, he was truly a polite man, and while his manner was often constrained and even awkward, yet he would usually make a favorable impression through his evident desire to please. However, before he became famous in war, he was generally underrated by his casual acquaintances, for in such society he was a taciturn man, and would listen in silence while others discoursed at length upon subjects in which he was himself well versed. He would thus create a false impression of his own acquirements, which were very considerable outside of collegiate learning, and embraced a wide knowledge of men and things. Well, thank you so much for listening. Please come back for our next video. Reach down, click like, and subscribe on this one. Leave a comment down below. Love to hear from you. Love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.